do that. I've done it. Right. Welcome to everybody and thank you for your patience. My name is David Worthington and I work at the University of the Highlands and Islands, which is in the north of Scotland. And you're very welcome to our first, our inaugural Coastal History, Coastal Studies Roundtable on Fractured Coasts. And I'm really pleased to see so many of you here and I hope you will enjoy the event. Um, assisting me here in terms of organising this are Joanna Gaspar de Freitas of the University of Lisbon and Rob James of the University of Portsmouth. And Rob will be moderating the chat facility, which you should see along the bottom row of the screen. We have at the moment two, no, sorry, three um, screens. So you can't see everybody at any one time because we've got 50 plus people in the call. But we've got four speakers today, really exciting range of speakers, and I'm really looking forward to this. So I hope I can relax enough myself to enjoy it. Um, Elsa Devien of, the, of Northumbria University, uh, Jerry Bigelow of Bates College in Maine, Bathsheba DeMuth of Brown University, and David Gange of the University of Birmingham. And I'll say a bit about them in a minute. And just to get through a few basic things, we are organizing this, as I said, as part of a network that we've grown in coastal history and coastal studies. Quite a lot of us are historians, but by no means all of us. And we're very keen for it to be inclusive of people working in the university area and also people working outside of the university. It's quite an accessible term, coastal history and coastal studies, and it means a lot to many people. Um, if you're interested in joining that network and being part of our meetings, regular discussions, we've got the Zotero group, Google, group and uh, we've got all sorts of plans. If you would like to be part of that, you can just email me. Um, it's david.worthington at uhi.ac.uk. Um, and we can we can arrange for that. So that's part of what we're doing. Some of you won't be interested so much in that. But um, another thing I should say right at the start is that we are recording this. So um, if any of you would prefer not to be on camera while we're doing this, you can go to the bottom of your screen and where you see stop video, don't panic, that won't throw you out of the call, that will just switch your camera off. And if you'd rather your camera was off, for you to not be on screen while we're recording this, that would be what I would recommend. So we will upload this video to YouTube because many people wanted to come along and couldn't. Um, the next point is about asking questions. We're keen for as many people to be involved in this discussion as possible. I don't think we'll have a chance for everybody to ask a question, unfortunately. But if you wish to ask a question, you should use the chat facility. Um, and that is also available along the bottom of your screen. If you click on chat, you should see a column at the right of the screen that allows you to write a comment in. So what you can do then is you can either raise your hand there, or you can put in a comment like I would like to ask a question and your name will come up or you can actually write the text of your question and that will allow Rob, who's monitoring that, to collate some of the questions that are coming in. So that's that. Um, our speakers are going to speak in the order I've mentioned. They're each gonna speak for five minutes. We won't take questions after each individual speaker, but we'll have a long time, plenty of time for questions at the end. And I hope we'll have a good discussion around the theme of fracture, which we've asked them all to reflect on. But also really interested to hear your own thoughts on that and on coastal history and coastal studies, what that means to you, given that this is an inaugural event and it's a growing field that we're all interested to work in. Um, I guess what they have in common, these four scholars, there's probably more than this. They, they don't, they've not all met actually. I, we found this out yesterday. They all work on the coast, but there's something more to this discussion than just people who work on the coast and there's something more to coastal history than just people who work on the coast. I'm um, thinking about this, I think all four of them in their work uh, focus on the coast as a difficult place uh, and that was really what we're getting to with fracture. I suppose that's a rather simplistic way of putting it but if we turn on our televisions we often see a quite utopian idea of what it's like to live by the coast or on the coast and I think today we're going to focus on some of these fractures and dissonances, ruptures, or difficulties of the coast. And I think we'll see a mix of, I hope we'll see a mix of social, environmental fracture and how those two things interact, maybe other forms of fracture too. 
all four speakers are very engaged with the public in terms of the way that they do their work. Um, many have written for non-academic audiences, for want of a better term. Um, they've been involved in that, and I'm interested in, in this side of things too. It's a big part of what we are doing here. I think any focus on coastal history and coastal studies potentially has policy relevance. And although people like me go back several centuries in the history we do, it's really exciting to be part of a group in which we see the application of our research. So um, if everybody's okay with that, I think we'll, we'll march on. And our first speaker who's going to present her ideas is Elsa Devienne of Northumbria University. She published a book this year um, which in English is going to be called The Sand Rush, an Environmental History of Los Angeles Beaches. She's written a heck of a lot beyond that, which I won't begin to summarize because I've got four people to introduce today, but we're really delighted to have Elsa with us. So Elsa, if you'd like to just get going and tell us your thoughts on fracture in your work. Yes, uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much uh, for all the organizers of this round table. It's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to be part of it. Uh, considering my research interests, the theme of fracture immediately brought to mind the main, what I think is the main running tension in both popular and, and scholarly discourses about the sandy shore, the beach, what, I, what is my object of, of, of study. That is the tension between the ideal of the beach as a democratic space where people from all backgrounds play alongside each other and the reality of the beach as a fundamentally fractured, fragmented, divided space divided uh, by social class, of course, but also by race and ethnicity, uh, sometimes based on sexuality, if you think of the history of gay beaches, but really uh, divided by all kinds of var variables. Uh, as many of you know here, social fragmentation is actually really consubstantial to the origins of coastal resorts. Uh, in the 18th century, European elites went to uh, coastal resorts precisely because it represented a strategy of social distinction. And uh, again, I'm not um, uh, saying anything new if I tell you that in the late 19th century, when working class bathers started going to the ocean, uh, those same elites right away started creating new resorts uh, away from the crowds, thus fracturing the coast even further. But I'd argue that it's the 20th century that we saw coastal fragmentation reach new heights. Uh, in the U.S., the history of Jim Crow beaches, that is, uh, coastal lands that were um, where black beach beachgoers uh, gathered, either by by law or by custom, uh, I've gotten more attention lately, uh, thanks to the work of Andrew Call, for instance. And my own work on the history of the L.A. beaches in the 20th century contributes to that work of revealing the many, many ways in which coastlines have been fractured and fragmented. And yet, uh, my book, The Sand Rush also identifies, perhaps paradoxically, a post-World War II movement towards moving over such fragmentation, homogenizing an urban coastline so as to erase any sign of a social and racial fracture in the fabric of society. And what I explain in the book is that this was part of an amb ambitious, sorry, uh, beach modernization campaign led, led by what I call the LA Beach Lobby. And their ideal, the modern beach, was a homogeneous, stable, that's an important one, expense of clean sand. In other words, an unfractured beach. And, and this ideal was an environmental aberration because we all know here that coastlines are rarely, um, you know, that it are usually a discontinuous landscape of uh, beaches of varying width, of rocky headlands, etc. And we also know that you know, the, the beaches of LA have never been stable because beaches replenish uh, seasonally and they change shape, shape con con continually. This ideal was also exclusionary because homogenizing really meant adapting the beach to the white middle class family. And so that implied the destruction of the gay beach, the slow erasure of the historical black beach and the closure of the favorite places of the working class, you know, cheap restaurants, etc. And finally, this ideal represented a very real administrative challenge because the coastline of LA was and still is divided up among nine different entities that did not work together, even though sand currents, marine fauna, 
uh, cross these invisible borders uh, seamlessly. So did it succeed? Did their uh, ambitious program succeed? Yes, to a large extent it did, using artificial nourishment techniques and bringing together these different coastal uh, uh, stakeholders, they managed to enlarge the eroded strands of LA and leading to the perfect, perfectly rectilinear homogeneous landscape that you see today in LA. So today, obviously, African Americans, gay men and women can go anywhere along the public coastlines of LA and California. And, and certainly some public beaches have remained more difficult to access than others. I'm thinking of Malibu, for instance, uh, that's famously in the news regularly, you know, uh, around these issues. But in the 21st century, I think it has become more difficult to identify social and racial fractures along the LA coastline. And I'd be curious today if anybody can tell me where the black beach is in LA or the Latino beach or the gay beach or the, or the working class beach. I don't see these fractures anymore uh, because I, I believe by and large they've been replaced by a much more worrying, concerning fracture that between the coast where residents and homeowners are now almost exclusively wealthy and landlocked areas. So if the 20th century saw coastal fragmentation reach new heights, then the, the 21st century is begetting another kind of fracture between the coast and all the rest. And, and this is certainly the case in the US, but I think I see this trend elsewhere as well. And so in this context, coupled with the threat of sea level rise, fighting for public access to the coast, to the sandy shore, will be one of the defining battles of the 21st century. Thank you. Excellent, very um, thought provoking start. Thank you very much Elsa. Um, I'd be tempted to open it up to questions right away, but I will resist the temptation to do, to do that. We're gonna move on then to our second speaker. So keep in note your, your questions. We're going to have questions at the end of the four five minute presentations and hopefully they will interlink and lead to a response to all four papers. Uh, our next speaker is Jerry Bigelow, and Jerry is um, at Bates College in Maine, if I'm correct. And Jerry works at the intersection of anthropology and archaeology, and I think he works very much in history too. So, unlike the historians and the rest of the panel, you're very welcome, Jerry, uh, bringing different perspectives. He's a visiting reader also at uh, my university, the University of the Highlands and Islands, so that's a, a nice connection to make. Jerry has published uh, a huge amount in his field. He was one of the co-founders of the Journal of the North Atlantic. Um, he's also been involved, I think, he, part of your career, Jerry, as a curator at the Peter Macmillan um, Museum at Bodoin, I think it, it was. And um, so really exciting work. And his current, one of his major current projects is on the Shetland Islands, in which sand has been a huge feature as well, and beaches a huge feature in a very different way. So I will pass over to Jerry to talk about Fracture and his work now. Well, <clears throat> thank you, David. I'm, I'm also honored to have been invited to, uh, to talk about my work in this, uh, this forum. And uh, I'm also impressed by the, the range of, uh, of work that, that will be discussed today. I think one of the main reasons I was asked to do this is because my work <clears throat> Literally, it involves the literal uh, fracturing of physical coastlines uh, at particular points in history and how um, these geocatastrophes uh, had uh, major impacts on the humans who lived and worked in these places. And specifically, I'm quite interested in how coastal sand environments uh, become destabilized at certain times in history and uh, sandy beaches uh, are blown inland, the sand drifts inland, <clears throat> forms dune systems that continue to migrate and in the process uh, bury human settlements. And this is a phenomenon that uh, has occurred in multiple places around the world. It's really a global phenomenon. And uh, another uh, member of the Coastal History Network, uh, Joana Gaspar de Freitas, uh, is also doing research similar to this in Portugal. Uh, along with Portugal in Europe, there uh, the primary places where this is an issue is in uh, the west coast of Jutland, the Dutch coast, the east coast of Scotland, and the northern and western isles of Scotland. And my work is in the northernmost of these places, the Shetland Islands. 
And I've run two interdis interdisciplinary projects there. Uh, archaeology is my main contribution to the projects, but I'm, I'm the principal investigator of them. One was uh, investigation of a medieval farmstead that was occupied from 1100 to 1350 that was affected by sand blows during its occupation and then was buried in sand. And uh, the second is my current project, uh, which David mentioned. It's, it's the study of an entire community of four farms that was totally buried in sand when, when uh, sand blew in from a nearby beach. And that occurred in the later 1600s. And we've been excavating one of those farms uh, for several years. Now the goals of this uh, work are to get um, a better understanding of the role that climate changes may have played in these catastrophes. Uh, in this case, climatic cooling rather than warming and there was a pioneering historian named H.H. H. Lamb who proposed that during periods of rapid cooling, um, there was an enhanced uh, storminess in the North Atlantic and that uh, great storms uh, could cause shoreline erosion in these uh, rather fragile uh, sandy shorelines. Uh, another factor that can be involved in this is changes in sea level. Uh, today, however, we also recognize that it's, it's likely that a variety of, of human use of these lands uh, could enhance their vulnerability uh, to uh, weather uh, impacts, especially loss of vegetation. So that could be intensified cultivation, it could be grazing, it could also be harvesting of native uh, dune uh, plants um, for craft purposes and other reasons. Um, and of course, these questions of the interaction of climate and human use are completely relevant to issues that we're facing today in these uh, environmental areas and, and areas of human use. Um, another th theme that I mentioned that had to do with fractured coasts, I mentioned to David that occurred to me is one that has to do uh, with the present and uh, with management and with policy. And that is, um, uh, we are faced with a loss of uh, massive amounts of cultural records of all kinds um, along modern coasts from climate change induced uh, rises in sea level and also how they interact with, uh, great, with, with storms today. Uh, also, coasts are threatened by uh, land use by humans, uh, development of various kinds, destruction of uh, buffering features like coastal ma mangrove swamps, dredging, sand mining. And uh, what is confounding about this problem is the scale of it. Uh, there are, are so many coasts that have so many important cultural resources on them that range from settlements to cemeteries <clears throat> to sacred landscapes that are going to be eroded and drowned uh, in the coming years. And uh, it's, it's a great dilemma because there simply are not enough resources to either preserve or to salvage information from all of these places. And so priorities have to be set, but it's very difficult to set priorities without privileging uh, the, the evidence of different periods or the heritage of different peoples. And uh, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a, a large challenge. Also, it has to be balanced against the needs of living societies today. And I believe another member of the Coastal History Network, Anthony Firth, who I think is, is on today, is involved in this type of work. So I will leave it there, but thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you very much, Jerry. That's, that's excellent and raises other questions that I was thinking of in relation to Elsa's talk. So I can see the connections already. Um, we'll move swiftly to Bathsheba Demuth, who is Professor in History at Brown University. Uh, she works on US-Russian relations historically, um, Soviet relations, but not exclusively, I don't think. And um, she's worked particularly in her latest book on the Bering Strait. Uh, her book, Floating Coast, has been very well received. I read it recently myself, so I thoroughly recommend it. So I'm going to pass on to Bathsheba to just say a bit about her thoughts on this topic.
Thank you, David. Um, and thank you also to Rob and Joanna for doing all of the work to put this together um, and to my fellow presenters and to all of you for coming today. Um, it's a real, a real pleasure to be able to take part in these events despite um, being uh, along all different kinds of coasts at the moment. Um, as David mentioned, my uh, most recent research and most recent book deals with the Bering Strait. Um, so to coasts that are a bit further afield from where it is that I live now in Rhode Island, um, and a little bit further afield or a different geography than we've heard from so far. And when I was writing this book, I have to admit that I didn't realize that coastal history was such a robust um, and thriving field. Um, and I find that a little embarrassing since the title of the book actually has coast in it. Um, but the, the, what I want to talk about is kind of what the coasts look like along the Bering Strait um, and what that kind of might mean for, um, for coastal history more generally and about the theme of fracture. The, the work that I did along the Bering Strait in this book covers about the last 200 years of history and there are many kinds of fractures that I can think of bringing up um, over this particular time period. It, you know, Certainly there are political and kind of traditional human fractures, those that uh, predate the colonization by the Russians and the Americans. So fractures between Yupik Chukchi and the Nupiak peoples in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, there are the major geopolitical fractures that define the borderland between the United States and the Soviet Union that become really operative after the Second World War um, and create a real, a real barrier or point of fracture to what had been a long-standing pattern of movement of people across um, the Bering Strait, which is only about 50 miles of ocean separating North America from Eurasia. And it's also a story because I'm an environmental historian and pay quite a bit of attention to the pasts of animals and ecologies more generally in the region. Um, it's a history filled with species fractures, um, and in particular, the, the kind of fractures and moments of um, extreme stress imposed by commercial hunting. So walruses, which are a major character um, in the book, um, I'm actually wearing some walrus fossilized, all walrus bone earrings, um, go through a period of extreme hunting in the late 19th century from um, American whalers, mostly from the east coast of the US, and then again in the 20th century from Soviet hunters um, that really kind of fracture the, the species in terms of the numbers that they'd had. They're near extinction events um, for these animals. But in another way of thinking about the fracture about the coast that I study is that the coast itself fractures. Um, the, the coastline along the Bering Strait is defined by sea ice, which extends over the surface of the ocean every winter. Um, and is of course a, a space entirely defined um, and defined in truly kind of poetic and marvelous ways by the patterns by which sea ice forms and crushes up against itself and moves um, and eventually creates a solid, um, a covering to the ocean from Eurasia to North America every season. So it's a shoreline that then breaks up every spring um, as the sea ice retreats back um, through the Bering Strait into the Chukchi Sea and toward the Arctic Ocean um, with quite literal fracturing. You can hear it. Um, it's, it's a really tremendous and amazing noise um, in the springtime that breaks it up. But this brings me to what I think is kind of a methodological and narrative challenge to thinking about writing about coastlines more generally, or at least it's one that I found when I was putting this book together, which is that traditional historical narratives, um, as I was trained to write them, are very linear, right? And some of that just has to do with the form of a book or an article, which has a beginning and an end, and you have to write the stuff to get you from one side to the other. And they track change over time in this kind of linear form with an implicit argument, usually of progress or decline. And this is particularly true in environmental history as many people have written about, um, but it's kind of a formal part of what we do. But the, the coast that I write about is inherently cyclical. It forms in the winter as the sea ice extends south, it dissipates in the summer as the sea ice retreats north, and it's that cycling of the sea ice and the, the kind of literal fracturing of the coast over and over, year over year, that sets the tempo of the ecology of the region. It creates many of the circumstances for political and social encounters amongst people in the region. 
So it's, it's a place where the kind of cyclical nature of the coast itself are really built into um, a narrative that usually is linear. Um, and it's something that in my own work, I've tried to find kind of formal ways of writing through and around to build in the idea that um, within our historical stories, we don't just have linear stories, we have ones that are intensely cyclical. And I couldn't end a segment talking about this part of the world without kind of um, bringing in the ways in which there is a new kind of fracture that's very much um, on the minds of anyone who studies the Arctic or lives in the Arctic, which is that the cyclical nature of the sea ice um, is in rapid and really alarming retreat. Um, that, that kind of cyclical property that I was talking about um, is one that um, is very likely to disappear within my lifetime due to climate change, um, which is kind of a, the looming bookend to, for anyone who's writing environmental histories of the Arctic right now. And I think I'll stop there. That's terrific. Thank you very much indeed, Bathsheba. And for bringing up climate change, which came up in uh, Jerry's talk, but in a different context and a different chronology. So some of these trans-temporal discussions could be very interesting here. Okay, um, I'm going to move it from there to David Gange. And David, um, I met David first in 2016 when he came to a conference we had in Dornoch here in the Highlands on coastal history. And I don't think you had your kayak with you, did you? Perhaps you did, I'm not quite sure. But, oh, you mm -hmm. did, I think you did. Yeah. But David's um, recent book, The Frayed Atlantic Edge, uh, was very well received again. Um, excellent book, which takes a, a kayak's view of the western coast of the British Isles. And it's an extraordinary book. And David, your background interests me because you, you worked in Egyptology, I think. Um, that your first monograph was on that theme. And it's been a, a gradual journey to the coast for you, as probably as it has been for many of us. And it was fascinating to hear Bathsheba's thoughts on her relations with, with coastal history as a subject area. So I'm going to pass over to David now to tell us a bit about a different type of fracture or maybe a similar type of fracture. Over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for the invitation and to everyone here and to all the previous speakers. Great to hear so much different work going on. And yet, yeah, Bathsheba's Floating Coast is one of my favourite books of the last year or so. So it's a real surprise to hear um, that um, she didn't kind of feel integrated with the coastal history thing while doing it. It certainly reads like the work of someone who knows the field incredibly well. Um, so yeah, I'm very much a kind of new recruit to coastal histories. That conference in Dornoch was really my, I think really my first kind of engagement as I was beginning to put together the idea of the last project. But I really liked the coastal history label because of what it offers that maritime history doesn't. Um, much as the current work on ships and ports is brilliant, I really like the possibilities of departure from that. And I think what brought me into coastal history is a set of um, actually political concerns, including a sense that there are still ways in which the historical discipline can give too much respect to nations, to growth-based economics, and to the products of enlightenment political economy. Um, so I'm interested in the things that were fractured by efforts to generate integrated markets and coherent national polities in the 18th and 19th centuries. So I've been kind of wanting to do several things, um, to take subsistence on coastlines seriously, without any sense that a move to formal markets somehow constituted progress. Um, so trying to use coasts to flatten out the narratives that marginalise them, um, to try and learn something of British and Irish history from the perspectives of the linguistic cultures that are strongest by the Atlantic, and to consider how thinking from water might help us undo some of the most kind of problematic elements of our intellectual traditions. And since we've had spatial fractures mainly so far today, except for climate change, um, I want to focus on two temporal ones instead. And the first is the most obvious and painfully predictable of fractures, which is kind of modernity, colonialism, and Europe's so-called enlightenment, um, which involved kind of deliberate centralized efforts to fracture coastal life um, from the mid 18th century onwards, not just kind of practical destruction, but also ideological discrediting of coastal traditions in the name of metropolitan values. Um, I'm going to actually um, use a couple of slides um, as we go along. I will just try and put them live now. Um, people see my slides here? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, now I just have to actually... Um, okay, 
So, um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, one of the most powerful things that I'd really like coastal history to do is to undo a lot of that ideological discrediting. And the way I think that's being done most effectively is um, through the idea of potential history, um, which is surely a really powerful tool for coastal studies and certainly my favorite theoretical perspective to experiment with. Its purpose being to um, undo the dismissal of other traditions that the universalizing claims of the late 18th century moment pushed so hard. Um, and then the second fracture that I want to attend to proposes a, a kind of positive sense of the term, uh, ways in which thinking with coasts might be productively disruptive. So ways in which it might be an asset for us as scholars that metropolitan cultures found coasts so hard to integrate. Um, so first I'll kind of outline a little bit where my perspective comes from um, and then say a little bit about that second possible fracture. So the book that brought me um, here was The Freight Atlantic Edge, the paperback of which comes out tomorrow. Um, and this was driven by a few things including teaching the MA in Modern British Studies at Birmingham, University of Birmingham, and kind of getting frustrated about the damage done to the histories I could teach by um, the presence of that term British, and trying to think through how that could be evaded. And I felt that the continuity of coasts and water was a way to begin that, but also that experience would be by far the best tool for kind of thinking through other geographies. So I set off to spend um, most of a year in coastal waters. So I kept it for at least two weeks every month, um, and divided the route into 12 legs, the first seven in Scotland, only one of them, the last touching on England, and kind of towns were barely a feature of this at all. So I traveled for five months before I reached my second town of 600 people. Um, and an extraordinary proportion was through regions where English wasn't a predominant first language, um, whether regions of Shetland, Gaelic, Irish, or Welsh. And despite my title, part of the goal was to show that coasts aren't fractured that kind of despite the violence that land-based divisions of this island group have done, there's an extraordinary continuity here, uh, even if of a different kind than the word British usually conjures. Um, so the fraying or fracturing doesn't refer to how anything actually is, but to long processes of marginalization that were very far from complete, but do actually still carry the threat of their completion. Um, and one thing this journey brought home was the kind of gap between present and past attitudes to the water. There's obviously been an immense kind of extinction of experience when it comes to coastal travel, so that our kind of very knowledge base in relation to water is fractured. And learning water offers real historical possibilities. So for me, that meant discovering how I could and couldn't travel through um, rough seas. So kind of beginning to experiment on the kinds of waters that I'd never um, considered to be suitable for traveling on before, so high swell like these, or kind of um, breaking through surf like um, here, or kind of just dealing with strange confluences of tide and swell, often kind of traveling at night as well. Um, so yeah, um, building a kind of skill set at sea as a kind of historical research. And another thing that journey brought home was just the, the sheer scale of the presence and mundanity of small boat activity, which is obviously always vastly outweighed the presence of ships. So even in Ireland, um, the first figures we have show that 73% um, of um, boats were small upper rowing boats and only 2% decked sailing ships. Um, so to me, coastal history offers the potential to complement the ship and port perspective of maritime history with exploration of places like the cliff face as a productive site, or a family's tiny boat noosed as their window on the world. Um, so the new project started again in February, exchanges the modern kayak for traditional small boats and looks at kind of much more of the North Atlantic. So recognizing that the really prestige small boat technologies come from Turtle Island, from Carlisle-Linnet, from Senegal, or from Martinique, rarely actually from the European powers. Um, so what I'm about to finish with very quickly relates to the kinds of conversations that I'd love to have about potential coastal histories, obviously not anything um, so ridiculous as an attempt at prescription. Um, but I'd love to see deep exploration of how we can fragment the authority of the archive that makes some parts of, coast, of the coastline much easier to understand than others, um, and is after all the cause of so many of our problems in understanding a lot of coastlines. 
Um, doing that would obviously mean rooting what we do in post-colonial literature. And I'd love to see deep exploration of just how powerful a decolonizing instrument coastal history actually is. Almost all European writing that theorizes place and being kind of famously does so through grounded, earthy, territorial languages, language and ideas. Um, almost all leading theorization of water has been done in direct opposition to that tradition. So if we want to know what seeing from the water means, we can look to the kind of immense body of um, anti-colonial um, philosophy produced in the Caribbean and West Africa after the Second World War. So Glissant and Brathway are surely a better starting point than like Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. Um, can look from to the kind of really um, rapidly growing um, traditions of drawing on indigenous thought um, from the Americas. That so often makes water travel a condition of existence and kind of hydrofeminist feminist reorientations of our historical foundations. Um, so I feel like coastal history as it comes of age at the moment has kind of really powerful potential if we're looking from the sea as well as out to sea to erode and fracture um, some of the intellectual edifices that really need that at the moment, to imagine alternatives and to generate lots of conversations about what the most powerful intellectual tools at our disposal um, actually are. I'll stop there. And now I have to actually... Um, yeah, if you could just unshare your screen, that would be... Maybe I can do it. Um, right, how do I... There we go. Sorry about that. That's fine. Okay, well, I think um, all four of our speakers have given us far too much to speak about to cover in the next hour. So unfortunately, we don't have a, anywhere to go to after this discussion. So I do feel there will be lots of follow up to this. But thank you very much, David, and all four of our speakers. Um, right, I've got a job of trying to just get the discussion started after that. I found that hugely interesting. And I hope you've all seen the potential already of coastal history as an area for study across these diverse areas. We've, I love the way it's brought us from the islands and islands across the Atlantic to the Pacific and then back again. That wasn't intentional, but that's very pleasing to me. Um, so I think what would be really useful here is um, maybe just to, um, first of all, to congratulate our speakers on getting that started, but maybe the thing would be just to ask all four of you, um, we got a bit of a sense of it from Bathsheba about not being as engaged in the world of coastal history, and I, I would plead guilty to that as well. Um, from David, it seemed to work in terms of the conference. Maybe this is a question for Elsa and Jerry. What, what brought you to coastal history? Jerry, do you want to go first or? Um, sure. Uh, actually, it was uh, uh, serendipity, <laughs> almost purely. Um, I had uh, studied archaeology and history in college, and uh, uh, in the process, I, I was recruited by a graduate student uh, to be a research assistant for him. And the research happened to be on the, the Norse colonies, the Viking colonies of Greenland. And uh, I ended up working there three summers. And um, I'm from, I'm actually, my background is from uh, an inland area. And it was the first time I had worked on coasts. And uh, I just became extremely interested in coastlines and how people have adapted to their characteristics down through history. And then um, when I decided to do my graduate work, uh, I wanted to do something that would be an interesting comparison. And so I did research on the Norse occupation of Shetland, which is the other side of the Atlantic. Thanks, Jerry. That's really, really helpful. And Elsa, any thoughts on that one? Um, yeah. So I think when I was uh, working on my dissertation, which became my first book, I felt very much squeezed in between, on one hand, the sort of maritime oceanic history. Uh, and I, I try to talk to uh, a representative of the history, and I felt like we, couldn't, we didn't really speak the same language. But at the same time, environmental history remained very much focused on landlocked you know, areas. Um, 
and and also the fact is that I, I was writing my PhD in France, but I was working on the US. So I found myself in France very much isolated, but at the same time in the US when I came with all my French references, also isolated. And the, 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 the truth also is that the history of, so I work on beaches, right? T tourism, beach resorts, this is a very, it tends to be sometimes a bit parochial and regional histories that completely ignore the extremely important and uh, uh, active circulations of models, architecture, popular culture products, people that have uh, shaped what we think of as beach culture and, and, and a beach city, et cetera. So, so when I met um, Isaac Lent, uh, not only did that finally, did I finally find someone who was kind of as, um, you know, who was interested in those global connections, but also someone who gave me a bit of credibility. Because when you work on the beach as a doctoral student, everybody looks at you like, oh, so you're working on bikinis. Because nobody thought about sand and, and uh, you know, erosion. When I, when I started, it was uh, not something that I saw a lot in environmental history publications. So, so that's what attracted me, uh, the, the global and uh, the, the attention to the global and to uh, environmental history. Thank you so much for that. I find, I find it a really, I always find it interesting when I'm speaking to people who work in the field to, to find out whether people have broadly come from the land to the coast or from the sea to the coast. And I think it's a different, well, it's obviously a different sort of journey and uh, sometimes quite a complex one. And I, I'm, I'm certainly somebody who's come from largely terrestrial history to working on the coast and very much simultaneous with that noticing the work of Michael Pearson and, and Isaac Land and John Gillis and people like that. And I'm very struck by, I, I, I guess that Bathsheba and Elsa, um, you work, I don't know if you would define yourself as environmental historians, but I'm struck by the number of monographs that are coming out in that area. I mean, I, there's Kara Schlichting as well. I mean, maybe Kara's, Kara's here also, and somebody I've never met, but her monograph came out last year too. And when I was thinking about our reading list, I was struck by these books, book length works that are coming out, really substantial pieces of work that are coming out in this area. So I wondered if, if we, I'm not gonna hog the discussion for much longer, but if there was any, if you, Bathsheba and Elsa, maybe Bathsheba, if you had any thoughts on environmental history's journey to the coast, because I know of oceanic history and marine environmental history, but what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that hasn't been looked at or dealt with as much as it might? an environmental history that's very much focused on our literals? No, that's a really good question, David. And I think, um, I mean, my sense is that it's a space for, that's received some new attention, partly because people are thinking about coasts. Um, I think many environmental historians become environmental historians because they're interested in environmental issues more generally. And of course, in an era of sea level rise, coastal regions are on everyone's mind. Um, and the fact that uh, coasts that have been historically accessible that you can go to are going to be underwater is kind of, um, at least on, it's on my mind, right? Like places that I visit um, up in the Arctic will no longer be terrestrial in 20 years. Um, and that that's kind of an alarming thing to think about. And I think it's it's created some bridges between historians who have traditionally come at it from a maritime perspective and, and people who have been more um, focused on land. So I, I do think that that's a, a fair observation. Um, there's obviously, you know, examples of people writing about coasts that go quite far back, but um, at least in the conversations I've had, I think the, the looming specter of losing our coasts and the forms that we're used to seeing them is something that has pushed people's attention in that direction. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I can see that. It's, it's emerged in several of the presentations. Um, okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, Rob, any thoughts coming through on the chat facility or do, any questions that people have already posted? There are, posted I think Elsa going to jump in there and, uh, and follow up from Bathsheba's comments, won't you, Elsa? Please do. Go ahead. Just a very quick comment. I mean, was just going to reinforce what Bathsheba was saying, saying that in, in my experience, I've really... Um, notice a sort of, uh, uh, at, at least for the U.S. Um, a North American perspective, a sort of pre and post Sandy 
phenomenon where all of a sudden it seemed to have, to have brought uh, the idea of sub submersion into people's minds. And so all of a sudden you started seeing the coast in environmental histories a lot more. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Any other yeah, thoughts? Um, Go ahead. A few people uh, commenting and saying thank you very much to the pre uh, presenters for some really engaging uh, conversations. So, and, and I'll say the same, really enjoyed that. So, thank you. But the first uh, question I've got here is from Sam Grinster. So, thank you, Sam. Um, so, Ferdinand Braudel tried to find ways to bring together different kinds of time, uh, including cyclical rhythms, but his approach is often seen as a bit static, layering times on top of one another without really digging into how they interrelate. I wonder which writers people feel have wrestled effectively with, with these issues raised by Bathsheba and, of course, Bordell too. So um, I'd like to open it up to, to the presenters. Uh, David, yeah. Um, so the, the first book that I had a slide of, um, David Lloyd's Temporality, um, Irish Times, Temporalities of Modernity, is kind of primarily about the west coast of Ireland and is yeah exploring possible temporalities or possible ways in which we can use um, those kind of Atlantic coastlines to disrupt the kind of standard temporalities of modernity and I think it's an absolutely brilliant book it's um, it's the book alongside Ariella Azule that I go back to most when trying to work out um, how I want to handle those kinds of issues um, and he's partly he's partly um, yeah, um, trying to come up with a version of, of a way of treating the past and the present that treats kind of the present as a kind of toxic offshoot, as a dead end, and treats the many possible pasts that were kind of destroyed by, um, or kind of undermined by um, growth-based economics and enlightenment political economics um, as, as kind of things with potential futures. So tying living futures to living pasts and treating the past as dead. So overturning our usual assumptions about the relationships of those things. Um, and that incredibly bad in there. But I think it's a wonderful book on um, kind of imagining new kind of temporalities to place coastlines in. Excellent. They set, so yeah, it certainly looks like a book to read. So it's one that I haven't read, so it's one I'll, I'll make a note of. So thank you, David. Um, did anyone else want to comment on that? Did Jerry or, or else want to say anything? Or? Um, yeah. I I would, oh, sorry, Jerry, do you want to go ahead? Oh, uh, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> I was going to say, um, I actually think the, the, the people that I have turned to in thinking about time and narrativizing it have mostly been, uh, they come from three disciplines, none of which are history. Um, I think novelists do this in formal ways quite a lot um, because novelists are often interested in the way that time is recursive for characters. Um, and I'm not obviously writing fiction. I have to cite everything that I assert, um, but there, there are kind of formal ways in which uh, that genre deals with time. Um, the second, and probably to me, the most influential is um, indigenous ways of storytelling um, that often also have these cyclical elements that also allow for change over time in a more linear fashion. Um, in the way that they're presented to audiences and audiences are expected to take them up and, and hand them along. Um, and then the third would be ecologists um, who are often dealing with processes that are cyclical, like reproduction, um, like you know, annual cycles of, of production and death due to seasons, um, but are interested in ways in which ecosystems also change fundamentally over time um, and are not static. And so I think those are probably for me in terms of thinking both about the, the kind of structural narrative formal, formal problems of writing history and then also the kind of theoretical orientation toward time have been particularly useful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jerry, did you, did you want to jump in there too? I, I just wanted to mention that one thing that I find fascinating about um, about coastal history or just coastal studies in general uh, that involves uh, the cyclical uh, patterns and temporality is the fact that the, en the entire globe of coast is united by the effects of tides. 
and the lunar cycles of tides. And if you are interested in anthropology and in your reflexes comparison, uh, it's fascinating that that, that has structured um, life and work in coasts around the world, obviously to a different extent in different places. Thank you. Okay, okay. so, so um, Sorry, Rob, can I just come in and yes, wonder, I wonder. I just wondered for well for Elsa and Jerry, but other speakers as well. If um, maybe I don't know all the historiography here, but I wondered about sand as a phenomenon over time, and we've seen that in very different periods in your two presentations. Is there that kind of transtemporal scholarship about sand and shifting ways that people have worked with sand? Is that available? And do people take that long durée perspective on sand in their work? I mean, apologies if I missed something huge here. I'm not really aware of of that type of uh, using that as a as a focus or a theme. Um, one thing that I I think is interesting uh, about uh, the approach towards uh, 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 coastal sand and uh, uh, looking at its attitudes towards it over time is um, whether it's something that's beneficial and useful or whether it becomes a threat uh, and is a problem. And beneficial and useful could involve the use of beaches uh, for recreation, but in some parts of the world, uh, sand actually is something that improves the, ag the agriculture that's just inland from beaches where soils are poor is something that makes them better for cultivation. And of course, that's something also that's, that's uh, very risky because uh, during periods when, when there may be a lot of wind, uh, that has to be done very carefully or the whole system can, can get out of uh, balance, which is something that I think we are seeing in, in Shetland. In, in terms of your question, David, uh, I only could think of um, the book by Vince Spicer, I'm not sure of the pr uh, pronunciation of his name, The World in a Grain, The Story of Sand and How It Transforms Civilization. So, uh, which if, if, if I remember correctly, kind of had this sort of big picture uh, approach to sand as a, a, in its materiality. Uh, although I think there was still, it was mostly contemporary history. But. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so, uh, oh, so, Joanna. Yeah. Sorry, Rob. Uh, I was just going to say that um, sand has been my issue in the last two years <laughs> <laughs> since I have a project to build an environmental history of dunes, and dunes are made of sand. And I think it's a fascinating um, team because really nobody cares about sand it's just the kind of thing that we bring in our shoes when we go to the beach and we wash and it's so important in so many ways so and all the main one of the, the big problems in the seashore nowadays or even in the past has to be it has to do with too much sand or the lack of sand what we have now coastal erosion is mainly caused by the lack of sand so from an environmental point of view, this is a very interesting issue that I hope more people will be interested in discussion in the future. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, so I've got a question for um, Bathsheba. It's, it's uh, from Marie Todd. And she's wondering if she's currently reading a Kathleen Jamie, Jamie's book, Surfacing, and she's wondered if the communities that you've studied uh, were the same communities that appear in that book, if you're familiar with it. Um, I actually just got a copy of it because it was out in the UK before it was here. So I haven't read it, but it's about the Shetlands, isn't it? Is that, am I wrong? I'm, I'm not sure, so I don't know whether Marie, whether um, you wanted to... The longest chapter is about Nunavut, so it's... Oh, oh it's about Nunavut. Further east. Um, yeah, Nunavut's quite a bit further east, by about 1,500 miles. Um, it's, a, it's a big place up there. Thank you, Rashida. Thank you, Marie, for your, for your question. Um, Sanguins was asking um, on, on David on your uh, post-colonial point. You, uh, they wonder whether uh, 
how we can think of coasts also as sites of bloodshed, invasion, slave taking and other acts of colonial power and how our empires spread through coastal relations. Yeah, um, good question. There are obviously some wonderful books that, that do that, like The Salt Frontier. Um, and I'm currently having a blank on the name of the author of that book, which I'm sure lots of people here um, know. But yeah, The Salt Frontier is a, is a wonderful exploration of those kind of questions. Um, and there's ob there are obviously two different dynamics that, um, that go on in relation to coasts there. You've got places like um, Ireland, where the kind of um, the kind of metropolitan power comes from the land and pushes people violently against the coast and then and kind of empties the coasts um, in that sense and then you've got kind of imperial power um, that engages at the coast first like travel by sea being the kind of so the coast really is the, the frontier so i think there are some very very different dynamics going on in different places in those terms um, each of which has quite an extensive, extensive literature. Um, I'm sure other people will add more interesting things to that. I've got um, a follow-up from, from Philippa Woodcock actually here. It's a, it's a very interesting point. Um, Look at saying that they've touched on the issue. I think it's with, to do with sands and shifting sands, where church lands include coastal defences and coastal churches become part of the military landscape. So it's a so the, the shifting uses of, of of coastal spaces, I suppose. And then following on with um, oh, skip the name there. Um, and Sue uh, Jane Taylor um, again saying thank you for the presentations. Uh, picking again up again on uh, Kathleen Jamie's book, um, so that came to mind with some aspects of the presentations themes in terms of writing from a poet or, or nature writer. Also, the use of words in our contemporary times, wide and remote. Um, the question cuts off there. So, oh, uh, li 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 um, yeah, it does cut off actually. Um, so it's part of my question, but I don't know where, where it ends there. But, um, but yes, I suppose yeah, the, the, the use of um, this sort of language, um, so the, the nature right. I mean, David, from, from what you were saying in your presentation, I got this very sense that you immersed in, 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 in the landscape around you, or the seascape around you too. And yeah, that, and I haven't, again, I haven't read, read your book, but um, it, is that an element that comes through in, in terms of your writing, sort of this, sort of the nature writer that, that comes in with that too? Yeah, um, the nature writing's really important to that. Bathsheba does these things far, far better. She's got a lot more expertise in the ecological side of things than I have. And it's, it's really, really, really good at drawing all of those interrelations and interactions together. Um, in terms of the wild and remote issue, um, I, I really love the work of Barry Cunliffe, the archaeologist, who's oh, yeah. who a big classic book called um, Facing the Ocean, um, showed kind of how the Atlantic should be thought of as a kind of center of civilization, not as the kind of edge or end of it. And he, and kind of the tradition that's come after him, tends to treat about 1500 as an end point to that tradition, a point where things began to um, move much more on land. And I, I would push that much, much later and talk about the kind of, um, the real kind of move to, um, so the kind of center of land masses becoming the center of life along lots of the um, Atlantic regions, um, being a kind of 18th and 19th century project as much as a 16th century one. Um, so I think those the kind of coastlines that are often treated now as being kind of remote and wild um, have been far, 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 far more central to most histories than um, the places that people calling them remote and wild are writing or speaking from. Mm. Thank you. I don't know whether anyone else wanted to jump in there. I've got quite a few new messages, so whether anyone did want to jump in. Um, Could I jump in? There was a question. Yeah, certainly, Jerry, yes. Yeah, sure. Mary Todd about uh, whether there was research on cemeteries adjacent to uh, sand beaches uh, in Shetland. And um, I would just mention that uh, in Shetland and other places, especially in the northeast of Scotland, there's a, a phenomenon in which uh, the, the Pictish people uh, built cemeteries on sand right next to the 
shorelines in, roughly between about um, the 300 to um, 600 CE. And uh, these are eroding out uh, in various places. Uh, but it's an interesting phenomenon because the, the notion of, uh, of building a cemetery uh, on a sand dune right next to the shore shows that they had a, quite a different cultural attitude towards permanence and than, than uh, many peoples today. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jerry. Um, got a question from John, Jonathan Hislop, um, and it's a, a question for Elsa. Uh, it says, is settler colonialism central to the shaping of the 20th, 20th century beach? It's, it seems to him that two settler, settler colonial societies, uh, Australia and California, have been crucially important to ideas of what the modern beach is. Uh, there may be two phases to this. A, the beach is a space of white settler egalitarianism, and B, later attempts to create a desegregated beachfront with the emphasis on front uh, for very fragmented societies. Uh, and he says that his stomping crowd around Durban is an example of a similar story. The present present beachfront is one of South Africa's most successful public spaces but is, has a history of extreme racial segregation and also of complex class politics within white society. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this question, Jonathan. I think it's uh, it's interesting indeed how Australia and California have uh, this, this enormous importance in the history of beach culture and, and, and what we think of beaches uh, today and how they're they have uh, similarities in, in how they're um, settler colonialist uh, societies. Uh, in, in, in what I know about LA, I realize I don't know enough about what uh, Native Americans used to do on the beach. And um, thank you for the reference to Andrew Lipman's book. I'm gonna look into it. Um, what, I, what I do know, I, I, there are a few archives for, for, for beach views before uh, the late 19th century, but, but for LA, for instance, there used to be a, a Japanese um, fisherman village that was uh, basically displaced as soon as there was a white interest in the beach in the late 19th century as a place both for commerce, but also for tourism and for um, curative purposes. So there's a, a story of displacement and, 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 and appropriation. And at the same time, along this story, there's also an interesting um, uh, parallel where it's a white space. The beach is a white space up until when it's really desegregated in the 60s, but it's a white space where white people are invited and encouraged to um, embody the more exotic and savage, sa savage sorry, side of themselves. And, and in LA, obviously there's the Hawaiian influence where you borrow some of the aspects of the Hawaiian culture uh, but but leave all the racialized aspects of that culture behind, thinking of surf, for instance, which is completely whitewashed, uh, even though the people who introduced surfing to California are uh, native Hawaiians. So, um, yeah, this is this is an interesting question. I need to think a little bit more about this, but I, I'd be I'd be curious to hear more what Jonathan thinks. Maybe in a different, I can we can have a different conversation. Just the two of us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's one thing actually, which I could say is, um, yet yeah, uh, anyone who's interested, if we don't get time to to follow up the points that you you want to ask here, or you'd like to ask um, more privately anyway, please feel free to to send a message privately to the speakers, on or, or others, of course, if you want to follow up any of the um, the issues that have been been raised today. Okay. Um, so again, another question now. This is from again. Apologies for our pronunciation if I get names wrong, but a Rinku Peggy, um, who's asking how would energy as a lens to read time figure in the discourse of coastal history. So I think this is open to, to any one of the speakers really about energy and its, its way of, of um, being able to, to read time um, through, through it as a discourse. <laughs> Fly buzzing right in front of my face. So it's, um... <laughs> I have a really short and I uh, hope not too self-promotional answer, which is that energy is the central thing that uh, it's kind of the central lens through which floating coast is told. Um, the whole book is about transformations of energy over time. So I did find it very useful <laughs> as a way of, of trying to think about that. Um, and 
uh, and I think in thinking about coastal histories, it's particularly interesting uh, because of tides, as has come up before, right? That that's a place where energy is being exerted, you know, because of the pull of the moon and because of the way that um, the oceans operate on the planet. That there's enormous amounts of energy just moving around um, and hitting coastlines um, at the at the sea front. And then, of course, because they are extremely productive places in terms of um, you know, creating energy through photosynthesis. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, if I may add, uh, yes, uh, uh, the, the oceans have also made it possible for uh, energy sources like coal and for oil to be moved over, you know, immense distances that would otherwise be completely impractical with huge historical impacts. Yeah. Thank you. But got a question um, by Sri Marie Todd, who's uh, uh, looking down the thread. She's had to leave, so um, but it picked up an issue that, of cemeteries that, that David was discussing. Um, David Weather's now just noticed you've made a comment uh, for for David Gange about the, the the author of the book you're referring to. He said, I "Believe it was Andrew Lipman." So I don't think you've seen that on the thread, but anyway. Um, and Bathsheba is um, to about the saltwater frontier, Indians in the, in the contest uh, for the American Coast. Excellent. Thank you. Right, okay. Um, I'm going to open this up on the full screen, actually, so I can scroll down a little bit easier. It just means I don't see anyone as, as I'm doing it. But um, we've got uh, a link here from Charlotte Lieb uh, to North Northeast Ocean Data. So um, there's a link dropped into the chat if anybody wants to, to use that. So uh, following on uh, from that, Charlotte has said that data portals are for coastal management, such as the US Northeast Ocean Data Portal, uh, are increasingly becoming available to the public online. And these maps available in these portals reveal fractured, fragmented conditions in coastal environments and are meant to aid policymakers in working toward integrated management on the coast, meaning integration of uses in space. Yeah, integrating uses in space requires more than a pl planar view um, and more than a utilitarian view in, my, in her mind. And uh, how do you think the work of coastal studies and coastal history can inform policymakers' approaches to integration and or retreat? More specifically, how can our narratives challenge the planar perspective that coastal planners tend to take? So this is something I think we picked up in, in, in Jerry's um, presentation but of course it's, it's open for, for anyone to contribute so if I'll open it back up. Well I won't mind saying something. Okay. Uh, Please I think do. One of the problems with coastal management at least with politicians is that most people think of the coast as they know it now. They don't have a historical uh, view of the coast. And so many do not realize that the coast has changed uh, many times. So what they are trying to manage is the coast as it is today, and they are trying it not to change. But the coast is a changeable place. It's a dynamic place. And if you look back into history, I think that is the relevance of history, is to show that we don't have a coast. We have many coasts. We have very different coasts. And it's very curious that, for instance, in many countries, in Portugal and others, uh, the first that lived on the shore, on the beach, were the fishermen. And in Portugal, they didn't have houses. They didn't build houses. They had stacks. Uh, why? Because they had temporary um, renewable uh, stacks built on woods that they would change according to the coastline. So they had the idea that the best house in a, a, a beach is a temporary house. Um, and that is quite impressive because nowadays we are thinking and some scientists are suggesting that we have to change the way we live on the shore. Um, so for the Portuguese fishermen living on the shore in the 19th century, retreat was not retreat, it was just adapting. Mm -hmm. And to, have to, under, to show this, to show that the coast that we know now is not the only possibility, I think it opens uh, new paths for the future of coastal management. 
Thank you, Anna. Rob, I wondered if, if this relates to discussion about the word coastline, which we've has been coming in. And I wonder if, mm. if how speakers feel about the word coastline in terms of planning. Some coasts are linear, some coasts are definitely not linear. Mm. And, and is, does that does that maybe help sort of frame the question here? I don't know. Uh, I might I might add to that question. Um, the 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 larger psychological dimension of when people hear the word coast uh, in places that are archipelagos, uh, in many cases the coastline is just a totally dominant feature of the environment. It's not the edge of something larger, and I th I think it's important uh, to to recognize that coasts vary enormously in their characteristics, but also in um, in the psychologies of the people who live in them and away from them. Uh, they, they can be something that uh, um, uh, is just reality, everyday reality, or they can be something that's more distant and that is traversed at intervals. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, just Anthony uh, Firth has, has jumped in on, on this, this point actually and said, with reference to Charlotte Lieb's question, uh, the Marine Spatial Planning Research Network, and there's a link on, on the chat if you if you want to follow that, is just started to look into some detail at how to engage with culture. And Charlotte's question would be very apt in that context. So thank you for that, Anthony. Um, a question now from Kara Schlichting, and it's, um, I was wondering how the presenters approach the need for local history, cultural, coastal, sorry, uh, morphology requires careful attention to specific places and larger structures like governance or legal systems like the public trust along shore. So any, any thoughts on that in terms of the, the history, local history and coastal morphology and that's, and it's, it's the links there. their links to sort of governance and um, and other legal systems well um, I at least in 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 Britain um, there's a clear uh, recognition that different types of coastal environments have have different vulnerabilities to uh, 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 agents of change and there are rules and regulations about how those areas uh, can be utilized um, so there's definitely planning around them and and coastal sand uh, sandy coastlines are, are uh, among those uh, areas that get uh, sort of special attention um, uh, as far as other parts of the world I'm sure it varies enormously I think too that one thing, I mean, this is true for environmental historians working in all sorts of places, but the need to toggle between uh, kind of local context and um, kind of larger scales, both spatially and temporally is, is a pretty common problem. And some of it is, is a question of making sure that you are aware of the problem and are able to get sources that speak to those different levels so that you have very granular local information about how people are interacting with a place, how laws actually are received and used and implemented in place, but also where they come from, right? What are the discussions that are happening in parliament or in Congress um, that lead people to try to legislate a coastline or legislate anything? Um, and that, you know, some of that really comes down to the choices we make as historians in terms of how you lead our audiences and our readers through the, the kind of shifts that you have to make at a scalar level um, and how you kind of talk people through the kinds of sources that are present in those different places. I have much less expertise in coastal morphology or the legal situation than most people, but in terms of cultural things too, one of the things I'm, I'm most interested in is, is how intensely localized kind of responses to the sea interactions with the coast actually are um, in ways that kind of Jerry mentioned earlier. Like if you, you go to the west coast of Lewis or, or Harris, you've got this environment where the sea um, feeds the land, where the kind of sand makes things ridiculously productive. Whereas if you go to Shetland, where like 
villages like Brew were completely destroyed by um, influx of sand in the 18th century. Um, you've got the kind of opposite effect, but culturally, um, the culture kind of works dynamically against both of those. So in, in Lewis, kind of Presbyterian context, the sea is very much a court. The sea is a judge. The sea is something um, that will destroy you if you're not found, um, if you're not found kind of, well, if you're found wanting. Um, whereas in Shetland, um, the, there's so much kind of prestige surrounding the half language, the kind of language of fishermen at sea, that there's almost this sense that Shetland culture actually exists out at sea, not on the land. So um, despite the fact that Lewis Sea is so productive and Shetland Sea is so damaging, um, you have the kind of cultural opposites work out. And certainly for my, for my own work, um, doing kind of very localised journeys in little boats and then trying to use very localised intellectual resources from the places that those journeys have been, um, that seems to me the most kind of productive way of piecing things together and, and doing work. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so a uh, question here for, from Daisy Turnbull. Um, I'll just say, say actually, this is a, a, a new member to the Coastal History Network, um, uh, Daisy. She's, um, she's going to be starting a PhD at Portsmouth, um, a split site PhD. So welcome, Daisy, um, with, with Kathy Pierce. So um, uh, Daisy was asked that she just wanted to ask if any of you are familiar or have used a wet ontological approach within your studies, especially when thinking of coastal spaces as social or political boundaries or fractions. Um, if I'm allowed to go again, sorry. Um, so this is one of the things that I was kind of trying to get at when talking about um, Glissant and um, Breathwaite. Um, so I find, I find the wet ontological approach is really, really interesting um, and really, really useful and there's great, great work being done through them. What I'm just slightly concerned about is the way in which they tend to extend um, kind of the work of people like Tim Ingold um, in that kind of Merleau Ponty kind of Heideggerian tradition. Um, and Tim Ingold kind of famously, famously um, resistant to using water. In the last talk I gave at UHI, I quoted footnote four from chapter 12 or whatever it is of being alive in which he dismisses the whole of watery travel in one footnote by saying <laughs> it just leaves no traces like walking on land does. Um, and yeah, the, a lot of the wet ontologies I, I find tend to adapt the same kind of material that Ingold works with to a kind of wet context. Um, and I think, I think drawing, drawing in the traditions that, um, that kind of come from water that originally has kind of much more potential for that, whether that's someone like um, Karen Ingersoll in Waves of Knowing, which is a kind of wonderfully kind of wet ontological perspective, but one that's slightly different from the tradition as it comes out in so many articles from the UK each year, um, or whether it's drawing on that like really, really kind of rich and powerful thread of Caribbean philosophies that have been doing this for a long time. Thank you, David. Thank you. I'm aware of time, so I'm just going to um, move through the questions a little bit again. Um, we've got a question now from uh, Desana Yake Sampath, who says that, um, can anyone comment on the historical evidence of significant impact on coasts due to the occupation of Romans along the, the coast of Western Europe? So um, evidence of Roman occupation on the coast. Has anybody um, come across any evidence of that? Uh, obviously, there's no evidence of Roman occupation on the on the California coast. But interestingly enough, the governing uh, principle, legal principle in the U.S. is inherited from Roman law. Uh, the, the governing principle according to which the, the, four, the foreshore is public is uh, the public trust doctrine, as it's called, is, a, is, a, is a inherited from, uh, from a Roman uh, principle. So I just thought it was interesting to, to mention uh, that aspect, even though obviously we're very, very far from Roman uh, uh, occupation. In Portugal, we have several cases uh, of, or several sites of Roman uh, presence near the coast. And we don't have more because in some cases they were lost to the sea. 
but it's uh, quite common to find some of them uh, in Portugal because it's, it, they had a very strong presence uh, on the maritime area. And even in Lisbon, and this is just a curiosity, you can visit some uh, old uh, Roman Romain, uh, remains on, um, the, uh, on the subterranean uh, of some buildings in downtown Lisbon. So if you ever come to Lisbon, you can go and see them. But I don't know, I don't know if in uh, UK, for instance, uh, and Jerry may know that, if you have any uh, sites of Roman presence near the coast. I'm sorry, but that's really not my period. <laughs> uh, but I believe the, the, the um, I'm just looking at chat right now. Uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the uh, question about whether it, uh, uh, it could have caused uh, environmental issues. And I think there was another question in the chat about um, Issues of sediment, uh, sediments flowing into the, uh, th you know, essentially across the coastline into the, into the sea, and I, I I think that is a very interesting area uh, to look at. The, uh, you know, it's the opposite of what I study, which is uh, coastal sands uh, flowing in land, but uh, the coastline is an area that's completely integrated with interior areas, but it it varies with the presence of rivers and streams. And so they can be affected by whatever is happening to the land, as well as whatever is happening in the ocean uh, as well. And so um, that's part of the dynamism um, uh, that, that uh, Bathsheba mentioned that I, I think is, I believe it was Bathsheba, that I find fascinating. And I think it is a, a challenge to uh, people involved in management and policy uh, that, the, the coastline is an interface between two different environments. It's an interface, but it's a permeable one. And uh, that's one of the things that makes it so dynamic. Well, I was going to add that, um, yes, we, uh, for, mo for coastal management, I think um, sometimes we forget that the coast starts uh, in the mountains because the sand that arrives to the beach through the rivers comes from uh, mountain and soil erosion. So to have coastal management, you have to manage in some cases, huge territories and include watersheds. In a country like Portugal, where we are very, uh, a very small country, coastal management, in fact, a, a good integrated coastal management should include the whole country. Um, and that is very difficult, very hard to achieve. Rob, can I just interject just to say, I think, um, I think we should probably, we probably don't have much time for people to put more questions in the chat. I think we try and deal with the ones that are there. So sorry to close that down, but I think we'll, we should probably try to just deal with the questions that are there. Yeah, I think, I've, actually, there's, there's a lot, of, a lot of the ones that come here, and I saw a lot's coming in. It's actually uh, thanking uh, people for responses, or oh, actually, yeah, and adding um, some uh, a link, yeah, web links and things. So there's not as many left as as, as I thought, which is um, useful in terms of time. Anthony, if has picked up, um, um, I've lost it now. I've lost, I've lost the point on the track. Um, oh yeah, uh, thinking about the issue. Uh, about the coast as, as a wild space. So it'd be interesting in, in your thoughts on seeing the coast as wild um, because he sees it as problematic, but it's gaining traction in, in the rewilding co context where the idea of the coast or sea becoming peopled uh, social is regarded as say, antithetical to sustainability. So, um, so I think it's picked up on, on some of the points we were just discussing in terms of um, erosion and problems and who it affects, isn't it really? It's not just people on the coast. But any, any, any thoughts on seeing the coast as wild? Well, I, I find, a, I mean, um, currently in California, this is often an argument that's used by wealthy homeowners to uh, make sure to exclude uh, the people, the public from their beaches. They claim they use environmental um, concerns as 
uh, yeah, an argument to say we can preserve the beach better if we don't have constantly people coming here with their, you know, their food and their umbrellas and their and leaving all the trash. But this this is a very problematic argument. And but that, that by saying basically that a beach that is peopled and 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 crowded is fundamentally bad for the environment, it, it is a very problematic statement because there are many ways you can uh, manage a beach that is in a, uh, in a eco-friendly way, even though it is open to the people. So, th so this is a, a very, uh, in, in this day and age, um, very indeed, I agree, touchy and problematic argument that has been uh, how, uh, you know, green concerns have been uh, uh, appropriated by, 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 by people who want to privatize essentially public space. Uh, could I add something to that? Uh, a couple of a, a couple of communities or or parts of one community that are especially sensitive, I think, or would be to the idea of rewilding, is the fishing community and the aquaculture community. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, personally, I'm I'm not against the idea of rewilding. I think it's a, a a wonderful idea if handled effectively. Like, for instance, if the people who've done community buyout of like an island like Ulver or something decided they wanted to integrate rewilding into that. Fantastic, that would be wonderful. But so much of the discourse in the UK about rewilding is just kind of looks like a form of imperialism. It's telling people somewhere how they should behave um, from somewhere very different that has a lot more kind of economic power. Um, I think, um, again, there are, there are lessons from other places like the um, current literature um, in um, Canadian um, indigenous writing that talks about rewilding as a kind of as a project that begins socially rather than as a project that begins by kind of um, so this isn't explaining it very well um, I mean if we were to read just, just someone like Robin Wall Kimmerer for instance about kind of how we engage with the environment as human beings um, that is a much more productive way of starting this than imagining that from cities, people can say, oh, well, let's put a load of wolves up on that bit of land that we imagine to be empty of histories and empty of communities, um, which of course it, it absolutely isn't. So yeah, I think there's an imperialism to the way that this is currently being handled in the UK in particular, um, that we need to be very, very, very sensitive to. I would just uh, say from a, a kind of coastline that has never been unwilded in the um, the kind of view of outsiders because northwestern Alaska and northeastern uh, Russia are sort of considered wild to those outside them that there's a real perspective issue there which is they don't seem particularly wild if that's where you live um, so I think in some of these discussions wild to whom is a worthwhile question and it links back to um, David's call to kind of decenter the archive. Um, if you look at archives about this particular part of the world, the kind of traditional archives in Moscow or in Washington DC or Seattle or Vladivostok, they talk about the Bering Strait as wild. If you look at other kinds of sources, it's home um, and, and needs to be maintained at ho as a home in, in the ways that Robin Wall Kimmerer would find familiar or some of the other people who've come up in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, I'm aware that it's, um, it's, it's almost half past three, so I don't know whether you wanted to um, to draw the session or the questions to a close and, and comments. I th yeah, I think there's some really good comments. I think we can save the comments, so yeah. Yeah. I think we can then distribute that round people and maybe that can lead to further discussion because there's so much to pick up on there. But yeah, there's a lot of follow-on points which are where people have picked up on some of the questions raised and, and, and made further comments on that. So yeah, really, really interesting points on that, which would be useful to, to follow through later. Yeah, thank, thanks to everyone. Yeah, I think it's probably a good idea just to slowly wind things up, maybe. But wow, wow thank you so much, everybody. I, I've picked up so much from this, and I was fascinated by David's um, idea of coasts not so much being fractured, but doing the fracturing and in a, in a positive way or in a, in a really important way is, and giving agency to coasts. And that relates also to the wilding, I think. It's a very complex thing in this part of Scotland whereby um, 
you have a very powerful history of clearance and people being forced to the coasts in the eight, well, largely early 19th century. Um, a very powerful, very um, contested history around that. And within 20, 30 miles of here, you can find very powerful examples of people being put in un, unwillingly into coastal environments. One infamous one is a place called Bad Bay, where it's on the top of a cliff. And people were moved from inland glens, inland valleys to there. And the, the memory of that is that children had to be tethered to the house to stop them falling off the cliff. Cliff. And there's all sorts of accounts of people starving on the beaches around here. And I found that fascinating because in a way, um, the debate in Scotland, I don't know if people agree with me, but the debate has often been about the interior as being wild, which is also very offensive, um, highly offensive, partly because of this history. And in fact, our centre was founded as a legacy and a response to the Highland clearances in this part of Scotland by a businessman based in Helmsdale, which is one of the villages where a lot of people locally were placed. So I've always felt very aware of that idea of fracture, social fracture, or social problems in our understanding and memory of what it is to live on the coast. But it is a people's place, whatever we think of it, it always has been. And we need to explore that. And, and today's talks have given me so much food for thought in terms of considering that. And thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, we had 58 people who came along as well. It's gone down slightly, as you might expect, through the course of the event. But I really appreciate it. It's quite frustrating to not be able to go on and not to be able to have a cup of coffee and ask further questions. Mm -hmm. But we will try to do that within the context of um, putting out the video, um, also copying the chat and making that available, continuing the discussion on Twitter. And also, if anybody who's spoken at this or... Um, attended this would write to, like to write a blog post just get in touch with me for, for my blog which is uh, called Firths and Fjords and I'd be very happy to, to publish further thoughts there so I hope you won't feel this is now closed down and this is the end of this discussion um, it's never never a good way of doing things when you have a group of um, eminent scholars like we've had today discussing this so I'd just like to say thanks to all of you and thanks to Joanna and to Rob for, for uh, playing such a huge part in this also and we'll hope to have many more events like this in the future i think it i hope it went well i certainly feel it did from my own perspective and i'll let you get back to whatever you're doing and just uh, i'll stay on for a while but um i'll let you um make your own way and just say thank you and raise our appreciation for the speakers in the usual way i think Thanks, David. Thanks very much. See you later. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Thank, and thanks to the panel. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.